Cubism may well have been the most influential movement in the history of art since the Renaissance. Hi, this is Mr. Bruns, and this is our discussion on Cubism. Its artists overturned the rules of perspective that had governed painting for at least four centuries, establishing new formal and conceptual ways of working that no artist of the future would be able to disregard. This important and wide-ranging revolution did not come entirely unannounced, since certain experiments had already prepared the ground and provided encouragement. In fact, Michael Pouillet in 1911 acknowledged Cubism as the culmination of the task of simplification undertaken by Paul Cezanne and continued by people like Matisse. Certainly, the lessons learned from Cezanne were fundamental to all avant-garde artists' statements. He had undertaken the challenge of solidifying space, to treat objects in, as geometrical shapes, to portray near and distant elements at the same time and on the same plane, to sacrifice richness of color for the expression of volumes, and to structure the picture in accordance with mental and rational constructs. Pointillism had also contributed to the adoption of simplifi simplified and geometric chromatic plans for the construction of paintings similar to the work of the Fobs, had promoted knowledge of synthetic and expressive African sculpture, paving the way for an anti-naturalistic and non-imitative use of color. Cubism was created before World War I, and the joint inventions of two artists, two of the most well-known artists, that of Pablo Picasso and George Brock, who worked side by side in Paris, the undisputed capital of the art world before 1950. Cubism proved a fruitful launching pad for both artists, allowing them to comment on modern life and investigate the ways in which artists perceive and represent the world around them. Cubism was divided into three phases. The first phase of Cubism was known as analytical. It was highly experimental, jagged edges, sharp multifaceted lines. The second phase, starting in around 1912, was called synthetic Cubism, inspired by collage and found objects and featured flattened forms. And the last phase, in around the 1930s, was curvilinear Cubism. It was a more flowing, rounded response to the flattened and firm edges of synthetic cubism. Let's take a look at one of Picasso's famous pieces here, part of the 250, Les Demoiselles de Avignon, the Young Ladies of Avignon. It's probably one of the most radical and complex paintings of the 20th century. First of all, some contextual background to this was that Avignon, during the Great Schism, was the seat of the papal court in the 14th century. So it may mean that these figures are young ladies of the court. Yet, on the other hand, if we look at the title, de Mademoiselle was a euphemism for a prostitute, and Avignon was the name of the red light district in Barcelona, forming the most common interpretation of the scene. Now, if we look at the work, the work has boldness. It resides not only in its subject matter, but also in the size of the painting. This is 8 feet by 7 feet 8 inches in size. So, it's monumental. And we know that monumental was supposed to be for kings and queens and heroic things. So, Picasso revives yet renegotiates the ideas of large-scale academic history paintings by making use of the traditional subject of the nude woman shown in an interior space. There are other echoes of Western tradition in the handling of the figures. The two in the center of this painting display themselves to the viewer, and we would compare that to Venus rising from the sea. If we go back to chapter 20 and chapter 31 of our textbook of Stokestad, you'd see that. While to the left, taking that rigid pose with the striding stance recalls Greek choros. And the one seated on the right might suggest the pose of Manet's luncheon in the park back in chapter 31. But not all visual references point to Western tradition. The Iberian sources stand behind the faces of the three leftmost figures with their flattened features, wide and almond-shaped eyes. The masks, like faces, might emulate African art, which uh, Picasso was influenced by. 
Picasso has created an unsettling picture here from these sources. The women are shielded by masks. They're flattened, fractured into sharp angular shapes. The space they inhabit is incoherent and um, convulsive. The central pair raise their arms in a conventional gesture of accessibility, but contradict it with their hands. Now, are there really two paintings here? Do we have a group portrait of women? If so, we have a theme here of a group portrait, so we can harken back to some of our other group portraits that we've seen in the past. We can also say, you know, uh, is there a still life in here? Well, yeah, look down at the bottom. There is a fruit on display in the foreground. Now, what does that mean? Is it a sim symbols of uh, female sexuality? Is it fertility? Or is it just simply he decided to do a still life of some grapes and some other fruit, but done in the cubist fashion? We'll never know. The women, Picasso suggests, are not gentle and passive creature that men would like to, to be with. They seem to be angry. They seem to have some sense of energy towards, them, towards the viewer as well. Let's take a look at another form of cubism. This is the Portuguese. This is a portrait of a gentleman playing guitar at the dock. So you have to look really closely to see the man to see the instrument and to break down the dock in the background. Brock, a year younger than Pablo Picasso, was uh, born in France where he trained as a decorator. He then moved to Paris and began painting brightly colored Favis landscapes, but it was in 1906, Cezanne retrospective and Picasso's uh, De Mademoiselles in 1907 that established his future course by sharpening his interests in altered form and compressed space. So in this, this painting is part of the analytical cubism. Look for its characteristics. And again, it worked in concert with Pablo Picasso to develop this style. This is rejecting naturalistic paintings or conventional styles of painting of the male figure, a male portrait. Um, we see fractured forms, breaking down of objects into smaller geometric shapes. We see clear edge surfaces sit on the picture plane, but not recessed into the space. And look at what colors are being used here. It almost comes off being monochrome. Uh, it's not, it's an exploration of shapes, and it isn't the traditional portrait of a Portuguese musician. Only realistic elements are stenciled in. What he did is he's the first artist to insert letters and numbers into his works. And he did other styles, such as the collage, too. Now, I want to take this painting right here. This is entitled Guernica. It was done in 1937 by Pablo Picasso. And even though I've told you that cubism was between 1907 and 1930, and this takes us out of the pocket, the theme that goes behind this particular painting is the, is the theme of art and politics. This is one of the most celebrated examples of an artist's direct concern with a contemporary issue. And this is Guernica which came to be considered not so much a record of a historical event, but a, his, a historic event in itself. It was painted to express the artist's overwhelming emotional reaction to the destruction of a Spanish town called Guernica by the first use of indiscriminate aerial bombing by the Nazis. Francisco Franco allowed Adolf Hitler to practice Blitzkrieg, that lightning war, prior to him applying it to Europe on the small town of Guernica. When the huge canvas went on show in Paris in 1937, it was met with an extremely strong response, partly because it recorded such a recent event and partly because of its style. Now this could harken back to the Raft of the Medusa, where people were upset by that painting because it was done in a monumental style about a real event. Picasso had expressed his reaction in the language that bridged cubism and surrealism, fragmenting and displacing form without making it unintelligible. He had adopted the emblematic iconography, the bull, which might represent Spain, the horse, the bird, the lamp, the broken sword, all endowed the heroic theme of the story with a universal dimension. 
symbolizing the horrors of war. And this example of Picasso's conviction that painters were entrusted with historic missions to help mold a democratic civil conscience was emulated by other artists as well that we would see in research. Once the Nazis, because they knew Pablo Picasso had done this painting, they would the the um, the Nazis would bother Picasso in his studio. And one time when they were sort of uh, bothering him, a Nazi soldier walked up and saw the photo of this painting, and the soldier picked it up and showed it to Picasso and asked him, "Did you paint this?" And Picasso, having nothing to lose, looked at the soldier and said, no, you made me paint that. So what do we walk away with in this lesson? Well, we got three possible things that we can see here just from the Cubist movement. Let's look at the idea of the female nude. That's a theme. You know, we can ask the question of the depiction of a woman or women, a group of women. We have several paintings that are done in that way. How about the male portrait, the depiction of men? And the horrors of war, the depiction of war or revolt or violence. What kind of artworks can you attach to what we've seen here that you've seen in the past or might be able to see if you did some research into the future? Well, I hope this helps you out. Thanks for listening.